Buenas tardes, Alex. ¿Qué tal, Iñaki? ¿Cómo estás? ¿Qué tal? Muy bien. ¿Y tú? Muy bien, muy bien. Hace mucho que no te veo. <risa> sí. Si te parece, de momento parece que solo estamos nosotros dos. Voy a hacer una pequeña prueba uh -huh. de compartir. Dime si se oye bien. Un segundo. Hola. My name is Tash. Sí, se oye perfecto. Vale, perfecto. Pues dejo de compartir. Y bueno, pues en tres minutos empezamos con el workshop de Sonatype. Perfecto. Me voy a poner mientras en mute para que no... no haya sí, problema. yo también. <ríe> Hola, buenas tardes. Soy Iñaki Rodríguez, eh, como manager en AT Sistemas, y voy a ser el moderador del workshop de hoy de Sonar Type. Este workshop se compone de dos partes. En la primera, Natasia Jerobo, arquitecta de soluciones de Sonar Type, nos ha grabado un vídeo, ya que no puede estar presente en el día de hoy, acerca de cómo asegurar la calidad en la cadena de suministro de software. Y en la segunda, Alex Gamboa, director de Sonar Type España, contestará en vivo a las preguntas que puedan surgir durante la presentación. Luego mantengan los micrófonos muteados y usen la opción de preguntas y respuestas del chat del evento para formular las preguntas que luego serán transmitidas. Un saludo y disfruten del workshop. Hola, mi nombre es Tasha y trabajo en Sonotype como solutions architect en London. I help organizations protect and secure their software supply chain against vulnerabilities, attacks, and breaches. 
I do this by implementing our solution throughout every single stage in the SDLC. At Sonotype, we are focused and our main focus is on enforcing open source governance um, in your ecosystem to ensure that you're not bringing in malicious packages or dependencies. We also help to provide a remediation path to aid you in removing existing vulnerabilities that your organization may have already. Today, I want to talk about a recent attack that has affected over 35 tech companies like Apple, Microsoft, Netflix within um, the past few months. So I will explain how it all came about, how the attack was made possible and how you can mitigate this attack and what you can do to avoid this type of attack both this specific attack and any possible similar attack that may arise in the future. So the, the issue I want to talk about today and the attack is the dependency confusion attack. So when we're talking about software supply chain, so like open source coming from different various ecosystems such as Maven Central, NPM, RubyGems, PyPy, Go, there are so many, which I'm sure you are all using in your organizations. You think, how do we actually secure those dependencies that we pull in from those ecosystems? And what does dependency confusion mean to you in terms of ecosystems? So there's lots of vulnerabilities around in all of these ecosystems. Some are caused by um, development, developers making errors in their code, like simple ones, and some are malicious vulnerabilities. So dependency confusion is slightly different to what we're used to seeing, where um, a lot of times we've seen typo squatting attacks in the past, which are basic, and these come from developers misspelling um, a dependency that they want to pull. And through that, um, hackers and people with malintent, um, that's how they get into your ecosystem. But where this dependency confusion is a bit different is because um, this is not just an error made by um, a developer, it's actually based on having internal packages and those internal packages being found in public package managers such as NPM, PyPy, Go. So, well, not Go actually. Go is one of our, our exceptions, which I will talk about later actually. So, Alex Berzan picked this up quite early on um, in last year, um, about this time last year. And he was the first to find this and disclose it, which he has written a blog about. And Sonotype have also written a blog about this, um, which I would advise and recommend that you actually listen to or, or rather read about. And this is actually, he came to this for a research project and he found that a lot of ecosystems were actually affected by this namespace or dependency confusion. Um, like I said, there are a few that it doesn't affect based on the way in which dependencies are re registered and uploaded. So that would be um, Go and Maven Central, which some type manage. But the main ones are affected because, and the majority are affected because of how easy it is to upload on those ecosystems. So for example, for NPM, you just have to register and have an account and you can upload any packages without any official verification, whether you're a hacker or you have good intent. So, what happens, for example, I'm going to pick PyPy, for example, which is the um, package manager for Python packages, just because it's simple and lots of people use PyPy. So you 
in PyPy, you would use and you would define an external repository with the um, dash dash extra index URL. So if you are like a PyPy user, I'm sure you're familiar with this and you'll get an external repo defined and you'll tell that external repo um, as an internal repository of your components and you'll get those. So what I mean by that is that you will, you will call the external repository to, to draw that component in and it will first check your internal repository and then check the external to see if it's in that. What people don't realize is that the complex nature underneath PyPy and what it's actually doing. So when you define a repository, because it still wants to pull certain parts from the public internet, but certain parts from your internally developed internal components. So when you make a request with the extra, like with the dot, with the dash dash extra URL, and you're defining what to do in, it's actually trying to pull that in from your external repository. And it looks and makes a request on both repositories, both your internal repository and your external repository. And that's something that people aren't aware of. So it will look in your internal repository and external and check which version of that component with the same name is the highest and pull that in. So if I have an internal repository, um, um, an internal component in my internal repository called Tasha modules version one. And there is a component on PyPy called Tasha modules and that's version 999. PyPy, um, the way PyPy works, it will look at both and pull in the external repository with version 999 and pull that in. This is where the risk happen, dependency confusion occurs. And since there's no protection on who can create what in each um, of these ecosystems, a malicious actor can go into like NPM, RubyGems, PyPy and create something that they know is going to be used internally at a company and put the higher version. And the tooling will automatically go and select that library which was quite a surprise to a lot of people because it's such a simple attack, but it's quite complex underneath. And this is why it works so well. Keeping on with the example of PyPy, where not every single ecosystem may work in that same way, where a lot of companies and organizations are also subject to this attack is when they use repositories. And that could be our repository manager, which is the Sonatai Nexus repository manager, or JFrog Artifactory, or any other. Where they'd be affected by this is where organizations have the proxy. Well, this is in Sonatai terms. We would have proxy repositories, which will be pulling from NPM, PyPy, and all the other ecosystems that you have in your company. And you also have internally hosted repositories which store internally developed packages. And also you have group repositories which store most of the time your proxy, your proxy repository as well as your internally developed um, components stored in your hosted repositories. And with that, that causes the um, attack to actually be relevant and prevalent in your company because the group repository often works in the same way as the PyPy example I gave earlier where it still looks for the highest version in each repository and selects that. So that is how organizations have been affected and are subject to this attack. And Alex described this attack in his blog. And what he did was he went after a lot of organizations responsibly, I must say, 
this was agreed and he did get approval from these organizations to do this and he was just going for the bug bounty programs and was not acting maliciously in any way this is more so for research purposes but he found private package names which to me was the most intriguing part as it seems like the most complicated part of this attack because how do you know what the names of these internally hosted packages are and um, where do you find this information but alex actually found this in various places via his investigations so some of these were mentioned in some communications he found um, that developers mention internally pa um, named packages. This information is spread out all over the place and it's evident that he obviously put a lot of effort to find these. But what also helped simplify this search was that he focused a lot on NPM, not because NPM is any more vulnerable but than any other tooling, but more so because when NPM builds, it embeds some of the package names into the, the built JavaScript. So he could literally go to companies' websites and, and look up and find the internally packaged names that they're using because it was built within the JavaScript. So you can literally go on any website that has obviously JavaScript and find internally, internally packaged names and go and register those names on NPM and put higher versions on and people can accidentally download your packages instead of their internally um, internal packages. So by doing this, he actually was able to hit PayPal, Apple, Tesla, Microsoft, Uber and so many more. And so far, he's actually earned up to $160,000 of bug bounties through this particular dependency confusion attack. And he was purely doing this again with approval, but he was just making a DNS um, return with some information about the host name, the IP, so that he, um, so that he could see who had picked up these packages and they'd gone on to build onto the build system. And within his blog, you can see that he managed to get a few developer machines and CI pipelines to report back to him because when he put his packages up, it automatically pulled in those, pulled in those packages. So as I've mentioned that there are a few ecosystems that are not affected by this attack. And there were really just two that aren't, which, like I said, Maven Central, which we manage at Solotype, um, because this is because actually we have namespace coordinates on there so that we make sure that you own the namespace if you want to register and upload a package onto Maven Central. So this helps to mitigate the attack. Our CTO, Brian Fox, saw this kind of attack coming years and years ago. So that very that helped us a lot to mitigate that. And the second one being Go. The Go depth system, through the way you claim in Git and other ecosystems, is going to um, mitigate the attack as well. So if you're using Java and Maven Central, you're most likely fine with this attack or from this attack happening, but it's still worth looking at. And Go, if you're using Go, you're also probably in the clear with this. So previously, obviously, lots of people used to met, uh, complain about Maven Central and how hard it is to upload, but now you can see why. So this is a timeline on what actually happened we, um, Sonotype, as well as looking for normal vulnerabilities in the open source ecosystems, go and look for un unusual activity. 
And this is part of our Nexus Lifecycle add-on called Advanced Development Pack, which looks for unusual committers, strange activity within development process or our development process. And as a part of the, this, um, we managed to actually flag these packages during Alex Burson's research. And it's, it's probably a good time to note that actually this, this feature is called Release Integrity, which is also part of our new firewall release. So you can get this as part of our add-on on ADP to the Advanced Development Pack, or you can also get this Release Integrity through the firewall. And why this is good is because we don't just flag this as suspicious or malicious if we see any, um, any packages that have strange activity, we actually quarantine it using the release integrity, which means you can't download. It prevents your developers from downloading these suspicious packages. So, so as you can see, Alex Berzan actually started this in July 2020 and finished his research up till February this year. And as a result, he continued to post these packages. And in the end, once he published his, his blog post on the 9th of February, he released um, the details of 35 companies being attacked which we wrote a, a blog post about and also Microsoft did. And within 72 hours, over 300 copycat packages emerged. And since then, up till now, we have about 12,000 now. But on this slide, even at this time, it was 5,000. So I'm sure you can see how serious this attack is and how widely it's affecting so many organizations at this moment in time and Alex Bursan actually was creating these components and packages which he labeled obviously for research um, purposes and we flagged those at some time and some of our re researchers spoke to him and understood what he was doing we agreed between us that we would responsibly disclose it when he was ready, but we identified these flagging, while flagging these within our system. So our users were protected against this namespace attack. So I've told you a lot about this attack, but the next question actually is, what can I do about this attack? How can I prevent this attack from affecting my organization? And this is what you can do. So like I've mentioned, we do automated research and we are, constant, we are constantly looking for these kind of things at some time. And what we do for number one is we alert you early on if these kind of things are happening. And indeed, we look for other types of new vulnerabilities so we can identify them and stop them from affecting you. So the first one is actually just a release integrity, which is also finding new packages and helping you to um, automatically monitor new packages from um, entering your system and also scanning and ana analyzing these packages as they are created in all of these ecosystems every day. Another one would be to actually install Nexus Firewall. As I mentioned previously, releasing integrity and um, identifying it early will help you to stop all of this from happening, as well as just having the firewall in general blocks new components and malicious components from entering your um, ecosystem. The firewall actually checks against the proxy and checks for 
um, the same name space and if they match it goes into quarantine and blocks your developers from from downloading the wrong dependency being the externally um, declared package another another thing you can do is what we recommend you to do is to register your privately named um, dependencies in those public namespaces so on npm pypy ruby gems for you to create an account and register them you don't necessarily have to upload anything any real package but just to keep that namespace to prevent you from this attack another thing we have as well is on the day that this was released we at Sonic Type also released a community resource that actually helps you to to um, check the namespaces and to see if you're a victim of this attack and that is our repo diff on github so you you adjust your script and it scans and compares all the all the dependencies in your hosted repository against the um, proxy repository and it will show you the results if you are a victim or not and lastly within our repository we also have routing rules which block you and prevent you from um, making certain requests to upstream repositories which will keep you safe so i'd like to actually demonstrate some of this for you right now and i hope that this will help you so i'm gonna do my swift conversion to my terminal so i just want to show you with our firewall this is what would happen so in my repository right now i have i actually have a let me go to here i actually have one component called um common modules version 109 and now i would like to install 131 so what i'm going to do is just do my normal npm install and as it's trying to fetch you see that there's an error and it says 403 item is quarantined this means that it's seen that i'm trying to pull a component with that same name namespace and it's blocked it and put it into quarantine for me and i can actually see this if i were to just open url and see this within my firewall so this is the policy that has been activated and has come up, which is the namespace conflict. So whenever you have the firewall, it will always identify and store your internally hosted components and see them as proprietary. Therefore, it will not allow any proprietary names to enter through the proxy. So it's blocked because of security namespace. Quite simple. So when, when it comes to registering your name, you just simply have to go on, for example, NPM, sign up, or log in if you have an account, and store, store your name, which is very simple. Let me just put into and I've previously installed a package called Tasha modules. So now that is stored, that is stored as my package. Now I own that. So whoever wants to, if I wanted to do an attack on this now, I own the name space Tasha modules and I'm safe. So as well, when it comes to routing rules, it's simply creating one in your repository. 
in your repository manager. So I have one here called Dep Confusion. And you create the name and the description. You can choose the, the most for what you want to do, either allow specific requests. But in this case, we want to block any requests coming from upstream with the name Commons Modules. And then after that, once we've created that, we go to the proxy settings and then create and choose the rule and now attach this to the proxy that you want to protect. So we've selected dependency confusion, the DEP confusion. And now any upstream requests, so any request from your ecosystems will be blocked. So this is another way to mitigate this attack. In just the time, I will refer you to, to look on the Sonotype blog for further ways in which you can protect your ecosystem and stop yourself from being attacked by dependency confusion. Just like to thank everybody for your time today. I thought and I hope that you've learned a lot about how to mitigate this attack. I hope you've learned about what the attack is, just to recap, dependency confusion is when a externally produced package has the same name as your internal package, but a higher version. And as a result, the external package gets pulled in. And this could also be dangerous or malicious because you may not own this namespace when it's public. So I thank you for attending this workshop and I hope that you've learned more about the dependency confusion attack and you are aware of the ways to mitigate this attack. Thank you and goodbye. Buenas tardes de nuevo. Ya estamos aquí en directo con Alex. Vamos a ver la ronda de preguntas y respuestas. De momento tenemos tres. Eh, vamos, a, vamos a empezar. Eh, Carlos Ortega eh, nos ha hecho dos preguntas. La primera es si solo afecta eh, si usamos la última versión de los componentes. A ver, <risas> ¿Qué, ¿qué tal, Iñaki? ¿Cómo estás? Mira, este... Antes que nada, o sea, hay que entender un poco cuál es la raíz de todo el problema, ¿no? O sea, el, el raíz de todo este problema es de que la inmensa mayoría de la gente de seguridad no entiende cómo funcionan los ecosistemas de desarrollo, ¿sí? Entonces, ese realmente es, es el problema y estamos hablando de, problema, de, de empresas, de las empresas más grandes del mundo, como un tipo Amazon, digo, un tipo Apple, un tipo Microsoft, o sea, que no entienden qué... Eh, cómo funcionan ecosistemas como en NPM eh, y cómo, cómo los desarrolladores crean sus, sus aplicaciones, ¿no? Entonces, uno de estos, efe, o sea, efectivamente, eh, este ataque en particular, ¿no? Que eh, estamos hablando de, de un ataque en particular, hay, hay cientos de ataques diferentes en el ecosistema de... De, 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 de dependencias de terceros que muy pocos especialistas están viendo ¿no? o, que, o, o, o que entienden. Eh, entonces, eh, en este ataque en particular, sí se toma la última versión ¿sí? que eh, existe dentro de, de ese repositorio. O sea, eh, cu cuando un desarrollador quiere jalar algo ¿no? dentro de su... De, 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 o, o hacer un build, de, un, uh, de, de una aplicación, eh, los, las herramientas de forma automática van y buscan la última y la más nueva versión que existe, ¿sí? Y, y, y eso 
en general es una mala práctica, ¿sí? O sea, <ríe> y a mí me gusta relacionarlo. Lo, 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 lo pongo como, como, como un ejemplo ahorita, ¿no? Este, a lo mejor en la, 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 en la época de las vacunas, ¿no? Este, yo, no me hubiera, yo no hubiera sido o no me hubiera gustado ser el primero en vacunarme, ¿no? Contra el COVID, porque no sé si había consecuencias o secu efectos secundarios y demás, ¿no? Ahora que hay más de 40, 50 millones de personas vacunadas, hubo un análisis de, de, de los efectos, efectos secundarios, pues entonces ya no soy la primera versión, ¿no? Soy como la segunda versión, ya, ya, ya entiendo los efectos, entonces utilizo el binario, ¿no? Que, que ya fui, fue comprobado, ¿no? De que no tiene vulnerabilidades, de que no, 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 no tiene eh, 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 efectos, ¿no? Entonces, la práctica de utilizar la, la, la versión más nueva, ¿sí? O la última versión es una mala práctica y... Eh, aunado con el hecho de que eh, los, los hackers, ¿no? Por ejemplo, este, este famoso Alex es uno de los hackers muy reconocidos a nivel global, ¿no? O sea, haya identificado que había un problema, ¿no? O sea, que, 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 que los, las herramientas como NPM, como Python, ¿no? Los, esos tipos de repositorios no hacen una revisión de, de quién está metiendo este, o cargando artefactos, pues lo que, lo que hizo fue aprovechar todo eso y... Eh, y, 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 y pudo hackear mu muchísimas empresas, ¿no? Eh, entonces, la o sea, sí, es, es, es la última versión que es afectada. Recomendamos que, y como una buena práctica, que se usen rangos, ¿no? De versiones y no se utilice la, el, la funcionalidad de jalar la última versión que existe dentro de, 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 de un repositorio, ¿no? Entonces, es, eso en realidad es, 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 es una, una de las prácticas, pero quiero enfatizar, es un problema del, de, de desconocimiento de cómo funcionan uh, los ecosistemas de desarrollo y, y los repositorios públicos. Uh -huh. Perfecto. Eh, también nos preguntan por aquí, eh, ¿por qué no está afectado el repositorio central de Maven? A ver, es, esa pregunta está un poco sesgada porque, este, y no sé si lo puedo contestar uh, no, no, objetivamente, ¿no? O sea, eh, y lo digo porque el repositorio central del Maven eh, es, es, está guardado y custodiado por Sonatype desde hace muchísimos años, ¿sí? Entonces, prácticamente cualquier persona que haya, este, a, a, haya desarrollado en Java ha utilizado o descargado uh, repositorios de, o, o, o artefactos de los servidores de, de Sonatype, ¿no? Entonces, una de, de, de las cosas que nosotros hacemos para el ecosistema de Java es que hacemos un proceso de validación y de, nos aseguramos de que la persona que quiere cargar un proyecto ¿no? dentro del de repositorio sea realmente el dueño de ese proyecto. ¿Sí? Entonces, poniéndolo en formas muy sencillas. O sea, lo hacemos de forma, o sea, con coordenadas, o sea, es un poco más complejo en hacerlo, pero eh, efectiva, efectivamente nosotros nos preocupamos por mantener el, la, la seguridad del ecosistema de Java y validamos eso. Hay otros ecosistemas ¿no? Eh, que no hacen esa revisión. ¿Sí? Entonces, eh, eh, cualquier persona puede cargar su proyecto ¿no? dentro de, de, del repositorio y puede ponerle el nombre que ellos quieran. ¿no? Por eso pueden poner, replicar el nombre que utilizan uh, las empresas, ¿no? de, de, el mismo nombre, y uh, las herramientas de Build, cuando buscan descargar esa aplicación uh, o, o descargar ese componente, pues va y jala la última versión. ¿sí? Entonces, por lo general es, es Maven Central, es Go, ¿no? Los, uh, los ecosistemas que, que, men, que no tienen este tipo de, 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 de riesgos para, para este tipo de ataque. Enfatizo, es este tipo de ataque. ¿no? Vale, pues creo que queda bastante claro. Y por tercera y última pregunta, también Carlos se ha animado. Eh, me pregunta eh, cuáles son los entornos más susceptibles. Yo entiendo si son entornos previos o, o productivos y por qué. Okay. 
A ver, los, los, los entornos... Y bueno, en primer lugar, gracias a Carlos <risa> por su participación. Este, a ver, los entornos que, que, que son más perjudicados son, y, y el que hemos visto que es el, el, el más, más perjudicado, es todo el, el entorno de Javascript ¿no? o de, de NPM. ¿sí? Eh, el, si, 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 si viste en la, en, en la sesión, o sea... Eh, una vez que eh, Alex, ¿no? el, el hacker, publicó ¿no? cómo él hacía este, este ataque, de repente comenzaron a surgir muchísimas eh, copias, ¿no? los famosos copycats, que estaban replicando este ataque de forma masiva, ¿no? a tal punto que en un par de meses han habido más de 12,000 ataques ¿sí? eh, o, copiando la forma en que, eh, en que, en que Alex ¿no? eh, 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 pudo uh, atacar ¿no? a, a, a Apple, pudo atacar a Tesla, pudo atacar a Microsoft, ¿no? Entonces, eh, 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 el, el hecho es de que eh, ecosistemas como, como el de NPM o el de JavaScript, literalmente es muy fácil, muy fácil encontrar los nombres de, los, uh, de, de, de las librerías o de los componentes que están siendo utilizados, porque, porque JavaScript por lo general se usa para construir páginas web. ¿No? Entonces, tú al entrar a una página web, hay herramientas que te van a decir todos los componentes y todos los elementos de JavaScript que están siendo utilizados dentro de esa, de esa página web. ¿no? Entonces, eh, NPM es uno de los, de, de, de los ecosistemas que, 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 que más han sufrido este tipo de ataques, pero hay otros dos ecosistemas que, es, que han sufrido mucho y que son muy, muy populares. Uno es el de PyPy, que es el repositorio en donde se guardan todas las librerías de Python, ¿no? Entonces, toda la gente que está haciendo la minería de datos, anal este, eh, analítica, ese tipo de cosas, van a estar escribiendo cosas en Python, ¿no? Entonces, eh, ese es otro de los ec ecosistemas que eh, estamos viendo que, que, que hay más ataques, ¿no? Y, y que los hackers están... Uh, eh, eh, Uh, encontrando más formas de, eh, de meter ¿no? y, y replicar estos nombres para después esperar a que ese eh, eh, su, su binario sea in, 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 ingresado dentro de las empresas y, y, y de ahí tomar el control de, 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 bueno, de lo que ellos quieran, ¿no? o sea, eh, cuando, cuando, cuando ingrese ya su binario dentro de, de la empresa. ¿sí? Entonces, realmente... Eh, la, yo no conozco ninguna empresa que no esté utilizando JavaScript en una forma u otra. Hay muy pocas que no lo estén utilizando. Es el ecosistema uh, que, que más se usa. Si, para que te des una idea, hay cerca de 1.5 trillones de descargas de JavaScript al año. ¿sí? Entonces, es, se usa de forma masiva. Eh, Python es uno de los nuevos eco, de los ecosistemas más populares y con, con mayor crecimiento. Entonces, estás hablando de que dos de los ecosistemas más usados en el mundo para programación y en el DevOps son susceptibles a este tipo de ataques. ¿no? Y, y, y realmente muy pocas personas están haciendo... Uh, es, entienden el problema ¿no? y, y muy pocas personas están as, uh, uh, haciendo algo para cubrirse ¿no? y, 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 y tarde o temprano ¿no? o sea, lo, los hackers sí se están dando cuenta, ¿no? por eso están replicándolo tanto ¿no? y, y Zona Type, nuestro, nuestro trabajo de tratar de evangelizar y, y alertar al, 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 a la comunidad de DevOps ¿no? pensamos que, 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 que sería bueno poder este... Eh, informar la comunidad en España ¿no? de, de este tipo de ataques eh, que, que, que no son muy conocidos, no, no, no son el famoso ransomware en España, todos hablan de ransomware y todo este tipo de cosas, pero atrás de todo eso hay ataques súper sofisticados que, 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 que las personas ni siquiera se están dando cuenta de, de, de que existen y si están existiendo y están creciendo exponencialmente. Pues muchísimas gracias por, la, por las respuestas y por las aclaraciones. Y bueno, veo que no tenemos más preguntas. Eh, muchas gracias, Alex, por, por este momento de preguntas y respuestas. Agradecer también a, a Tasa eh, su, su vídeo sobre el workshop. A los asistentes también agradeceros el, el haber estado aquí. Si tenéis más dudas podéis escribir a marketing.atesistemas.com y bueno, pues eh, encantado de haber estado con vosotros este ratito y espero vernos en, en otras ocasiones.
Así es. Espero verlos mañana en el keynote de Sonatec. Allí estaremos. <ríe> Muchísimas gracias. Que tengas muy buena tarde, Iñaki. Igualmente. Hasta luego.